Um, but yeah, I just want to chat a little bit about uh, this guy. I recently discovered myself. Some people know about him. I, I think it's a, if you go to a state school, you probably didn't hear about him. If you go to a fancy private school, you probably know about him. But I just discovered him uh, through the wonders of the internet. And it's this uh, philosopher, this French Algerian philosopher. Uh, just bear with me, this is going to pay off, I promise you. People are kind of rolling their eyes already. Um, let me see here. So he was born in 1913 in Moldovi, French Algeria. Um, and he actually came to win the Nobel, Pre the Nobel Prize in Literature at the age of 44, I think. So he's like the second youngest all time to win that. Um, and the reason he, he won that was because he, uh, he wrote some really important works that even if you don't know him, you actually encounter his arguments in every day. It's, it's, it's all in the political discourse. Uh, you don't know it. He's kind of the founder of a lot of these thoughts that, you know, we believe in equality, justice, how to make this sort of argument without God, how to make these arguments without the notion of some higher being, some higher order. So that really just talked to me, right, because I, I, I'm also godless. I'm an atheist. And... Uh, have been for a while now, grew up, a little background, uh, super in the church, evangelical, speaking in tongues, all that stuff. Uh, it was kind of a, a little divorce uh, to go through that process with my parents. We love each other. It's great. Um, so this helps me, you know, as a godless individual, kind of navigate life and kind of understand why things happen, right? Why good things happen to bad people, bad things happen to good people. It's inherent, I think, in our human condition, and this is kind of Albert Camus' argument, that this is what makes us human, to kind of uh, be aware of that, kind of, kind of, we have to fight through it, you know, it's, it's not, the do dogs and cats don't think about, you know, their existence, they just don't, it's not part of their human condition, but we all kind of think about it, it's, it's really what makes us human, modern humans, really, and there, there are different ways to kind of d resolve these concerns and, and deal with them, and and uh, he, had, he talks about these, right? He talks about uh, the various options we have uh, to navigate, um, I guess, our existence in a godless world. Because he himself, he didn't say he was an atheist outright, uh, but he didn't really believe in God. He didn't really believe, like, he kind of believed that it, this is all we had. This is kind of aligned with what we believe here in Oasis, that, you know, we, we have control to make things better for those around us and improve society. And it's kind of our obligation. It's our duty to help each other. Um, and these were some of his more famous works. The ones that I just discovered him recently, so I'm not an expert. Um, but I, I have read The Stranger, which I thought was really interesting. I, I, I still don't know if I like the protagonist. He's kind of a jerk, but that's kind of the point. Um, the Myth of Sisyphus, uh, the essay, it's, it's really interesting. Y'all know the, uh, the Myth of Sisyphus with the guy that's been condemned to roll the rock up and down, up and down. And Camus talked a lot about the repetitive nature of life and how it sometimes can get kind of boring and down. You feel the malaise. Uh, but he talks about, you know, when you think of Sisyphus, you have to think of him as, as a happy individual, as kind of enjoying this, the experience itself, and, and that's kind of uh, the absurd hero. So he, he kind of defined the, the philosophy of, of, of absurdism. Um, and the hero was the guy that, can, that, that acknowledges this, that, that understands, you know, without getting too dark and too kind of uh, in, the, in the weeds, you know, life is meaningless, all these things, right? Um, you're aware of that, but you still live on. You still want to live a meaningful life and help those around you and, and kind of make matter, right? And so um, that was kind of his philosophy, uh, kind of a, a large view, right? Like, you, you got to, it's, it's up to us at the end of the day. And uh, he even talked about rebellion. I won't, I won't really focus on the rebellion part today, but he also kind of made arguments for why it's important to step up and speak up for those that cannot speak up for themselves. And so he was kind of a, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't want to say provocateur, but uh, he definitely wrote a lot. He was really important at the time. And uh, he talked about a lot of really important themes. You can't really read this, but he talked about the absurd, uh, which we just discussed. So the absurd is essentially you know, our desire to seek meaning uh, it, and ask these big questions like, why are we here? You know, what, do, what does it all mean? That sort of thing. And, uh, and the universe is essentially silent on these questions, right? They, it, it's kind of indifferent. It's not mean. It's not angry. It's not, you know, trying to make this difficult for us. But uh, it doesn't really answer the questions. And it's kind of an unsettling feeling that we all have, I think. And um, he talked about the different ways that people resolve uh, the absurd. So we really only have three, three responses. And bear with me here. You can't really read this, unfortunately. Uh, but he talked about two forms of suicide, the physical suicide, the one that we all fight, that we don't, you know, we always 
try to try to help those that are going through tough times. We, we, I mean, it's upsetting, I think, to all of us that enjoy this life experience when people, you know, don't and, 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 they, and they end their lives. Uh, he was vehemently against suicide of all forms and philosophical suicide, which is kind of you give up. You, you, you believe something that's comfortable. You believe something that, you know, you, it helps distract you from this kind of condition that we got to deal with. So religion, he talked oftentimes, was kind of the biggest, most popular. I mean, God, right? God's the answer. Hey, what does it all mean? You know, we're not that smart. We're not that bright. God knows. God's in charge. Relax, right? He kind of says that's a cop out. You know, you got to really deal with this. You got to grapple with it. And in that grappling, in that dealing with it, as hard as it may be, that's where the meaning might lie. And he's not even sure if life has meaning. Uh, but if it, if, it, if it does, uh, it's something that we may never be able to understand, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't pursue it, that we shouldn't actually go after it, because that's where we're happiest. You know, that's when we're living life, when we're spending time with our loved ones, when we're doing the things that actually bring us joy and happiness. You know, what you, even with the knowledge that none of this matters, you know, that's who he considered a, a hero in this. Like, this is the absurd hero, the person that understands the grand scheme of things, but still lives passionately. And he advocated for that, living passionately, enjoying. He was, he was actually a, uh, an advocate for the everyday, the mundane, like the ordinary life experience. He actually talked very highly of it and how it's actually a really cool thing that we get to do all the things that we get to do in modern society. This was back in the 1940s. Um, but ultimately, you know, he says life can be lived all the better, even if it has no meaning. You know, the, the fact that nothing, like we are kind of in control, which is exciting. So he definitely advocating for, advocated for living life kind of with an extra... I don't know, like a uh, burst of energy, like more passion, more in the moment, right? Don't, don't take things for granted. And he actually uh, talked a lot also about death, unfortunately. I mean, it's, it's part of life, you know? And it, he actually said it's not so bad to think about it when it makes you feel grateful for what the here and now. Like, you know, these are all temporary ephemeral experiences, right? And, and, and it helps me. I mean, this is why I kind of gravitate towards this, because I do, I worry. I mean, I think we all kind of, not even for me, but my parents, you know, I, I love them dearly. And they're getting up there, and so when you think about, oh man, you know, uh, they might be gone one day, right? I'm lucky to have them so far where they are today, but instead of focusing on that, I focus on the here and now. Like, I, I'm more likely to invite my dad now to a baseball game. I feel like this is the time I have. I don't want to regret, you know, when he's gone, he, I won't have these opportunities. So it helps me actually, it spurs me to action to like interact a little more than I, 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 I already kind of do, but. I feel like after I've discovered Camus, I don't know, maybe my wife disagrees, but I've been organizing a lot more family events, a lot more friend kind of get-togethers. I've been coming more to Oasis, because he did advocate for living human life to its fullest. And, and he thought a lot about, well, what, what do we like as humans? You know, what we like organizing. I think Oasis is a good example of that. And he loves sport, actually. He's one of the few philosophers that was a, an avid athlete. He played soccer, football or soccer, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but he felt, he, he loved that feeling of teamwork, that unity, that shared purpose, you know, and he felt like that's kind of what makes us human, you know? And sometimes it, it, it doesn't work out, and we, we unfortunately are misdirected in areas that lead to organized terrorism or other sorts of, you know, tyranny and terrible. But we have to be mindful that, you know, that we're capable of that, but we should, as, as, as agents of our own existence, we should try to act up and, and, and do something about it, basically. So, I don't know, I, I, I guess I'm kind of near the end, but any questions? It just is... I, reckon, I read The Stranger, and he won, I mean, he won the, he was, what, 44 years old? Oh, yeah, and he died, in, of course, in an absurdist fashion. I don't know if y'all know this, how much y'all know about Camus, but he died at the age of 46, two years after he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, after, just on the spur of the moment, he decided to take a road trip home with his publisher as opposed to the train ride he had planned with his family. Uh, and they, they, they drove head on into a tree. The ticket was still in his pocket. And it's kind of like a, it's like a really nonsensical way for such a beautiful mind to die, you know. It's just, but, you know, it's kind of like Shakespeare dying on his birthday, I thought. Wow, he's so perfect. But anyway, I'll take a few questions if I have a minute. No time, no time. So we can talk after you're in the break. But uh, thanks for your patience.